So this is video problem one. We are considering a point charge and we will use Gauss law to get the electric field intensity of a point charge located at the origin in free space. We will also determine the associated electric potential. The corresponding results for a point charge which is displaced from the origin will also be derived or presented in this video problem one. This is the configuration. We are considering a point charge that you can see here. We assume that it's positive and it's located in free space with free space permittivity epsilon naught. The objective is to determine the field at the observation point P. First of all, we introduce two coordinate systems, rectangular, x, y, z, and spherical r theta phi coordinate systems. As you can see, the point charge is located at the origin of these systems, and the position of our observation point is given by these spherical coordinates, or alternatively with this position vector here. First of all, we postulate that the electric field intensity at this point is in the outward radial direction as specified by this unit vector and that the magnitude only depends on the distance to the observation point. And we would like to answer why this necessarily must be the case. Assume this spherical surface uh, with radius r that you can see here and uh, consider several different observation points along this surface. Because we are dealing with a spherically symmetric charge distribution, all of those points that I have introduced, they will see the same charge distribution. So that means that the field will be independent of the angular coordinates, theta and phi, and will only depend on the distance to the observation point. Now, why is the field radial? Why is it that we only have this particular component of the electric field? In other words, could we have something like this? So this is a component which is tangential to that particular surface that we have introduced. Now again, due to the spherical symmetry of our point charge configuration, if we have it, this component at this particular position, we would also have it here, we would also have it here, we would also have it here. And that would imply a circulation of the electric field along this closed path C over here. That means that the circulation will not be equal to zero, but this is not in accordance with the fundamental law that says that the circulation of any electrostatic field along any closed path C is always equal to zero. Thus, there cannot be any tangential component, and this is indeed the form of our electric field. We can see that it's radial at any point on this surface and also that it's constant at any point on this surface. This surface S is called Gaussian surface in this particular uh, problem and we can use Gauss law to determine the electric field. Gauss law says that the flux of the electric field intensity through a closed surface S is equal to the total charge enclosed by the surface divided with free space permittivity. If we can find a configuration where this electric field or the normal component of it is constant everywhere on this surface S, we can take this electric field outside and use this Gauss law to determine the electric field. This ds element is the outward vector differential surface area, which is sketched here, and uh, we will now consider what this is for our spherical Gaussian surface that we have introduced here. So this is our configuration again. This is the Gauss law, and uh, we know that the electric field has this particular form, and now we would also like to specify more explicitly what this ds element is. You can see that one from the figure to the right, and it is essentially the surface area that you can see here, and then in the outward normal direction uh, that you can see here. It will be given by the expressions here, 
and you can see how they uh, arise. Essentially, you need to take this side here, which is r times d theta, and multiply it with this particular si side, so that you get, get this surface area here. This side here is equal to this r sine theta times the increment in angle phi, which is equal to d phi. So here you have r sine theta d phi multiplied with r d theta to arrive at this final expression that we are going to use for our spherical surface. So now we have all the ingredients to determine the electric field intensity by using Gauss law. And let's first plug everything inside. Our Gaussian surface as is a closed surface and all points will be covered if we do an integral in phi from 0 to 2 pi, an integral in theta from 0 to pi. We have our electric field, we have our ds element, and we have the right hand side as dictated by the Gauss law. Inside here we have a unit vector r hat dotted with unit vector r hat which will give 1 this guy here, together with r squared, they can be taken outside because this integral is with respect to theta and phi. So we actually arrive at this particular result and the integral here can easily be evaluated and will be seen to give 4 pi. So we arrive at this particular result and we recognize 4 pi r squared as the surface area of our Gaussian sphere with radius r. It's fairly easy to isolate the electric field. The magnitude will be given uh, by the expression shown here and the final vector result will be given by the result here. So we see <coughs> again to interpret that the electric field is in the outward radial direction which is basically in the direction from the point charge to the observation point. It's directly proportional to the magnitude of the point charge and inversely proportional to the distance squared to the observation point. This was the, this was the electric field that we have determined at this particular point P. Uh, now we would like to determine the associated electric potential. And the electric potential is given by the expression here at this particular point. Uh, it is essentially a line integral of the electric field from infinity, where we have specified a zero reference potential, to our observation point here. In fact, we are determining the electric potential at all points along this surface S, and this uh, point is uh, then the distance to that particular observation point from the point charge. And this surface is called equipotential surface because the potential is constant all over on this surface. We can take along uh, different parts uh, in our integration of the electric field. We can go, for instance, along this red path, but because this integral is path independent for electrostatic field, we can also approach the observation point along this blue path. The L, which is the differential length change or differential displacement, will in this case be given by the expression here. And when you plug everything inside, you will have this result that we see down here. This is the electric field. This is the DL element. Now you can dot the two unit vectors. Their product will be 1. And you can take some quantities outside of the integral and you need to integrate 1 over r squared from infinity to our observation point r. This function integrated is minus 1 over r and when you plug in the integration limits you arrive at this result. So while the electric field that we see here is inversely proportional to the distance squared from the point charge to the observation point, we see that the associate potential is inversely proportional to the distance between the point charge and the observation point. 
So we would now like to generalize those results for the electric field and potential due to a point charge located at the origin to those which hold for a point charge which is displaced from the origin. And let's first look at these results for a point charge at the origin. We can see that the electric field is directed along the direction from the point charge to the observation point. It's given by this unit vector here. And the distances involved in the two expressions are basically the distance from the point charge to the observation point. And I'm going to use these properties to deduce at once what are the electric fields and potentials due to a displaced point charge uh, that we have. So this is the configuration. In this case, we have our common origin here. We have our point charge. Now the location is specified with this position vector R prime, and we want to get the field at the observation point P that has this particular position vector. The rele relevant vector in this case is this vector from the point charge to the observation point. This is R minus R prime. We immediately see that the electric field must take this form and the potential will take the form to the right. In the electric field, what you have here is simply the unit vector pointing from the point charge to the observation point, and this is the associated distance square that you have. And this is the distance that we are having, of course, from the point charge to the observation point that we use in the potential. We have essentially completed everything that we wanted to complete in this video problem one, but we also have a few tasks for you. For the results on the top, which are derived for a point charge at the origin, we would like you to express both the electric field and the potential in terms of rectangular components and coordinates. We would also like you to verify that the electric field is exactly equal to the negative gradient of the electric potential. For the expression that you can see here for the electric field for a displaced point charge, we would like you to express this field in terms of rectangular components and coordinates. And we would also like you to verify that this field reduces to the field derived for a point charge at the origin when R prime is going to zero. Thank you very much for your attention.